Hi, my name is Scott Messenger. I'm uh, an editor at Tech Life Magazine. I'm here today with Dave Critchley, uh, Nate Biological Sciences Technology Instructor. Hi, Dave. Thanks for joining us. Hi, right, Scott. Thanks for inviting me. Um, in January of 2017, I had the pleasure of accompanying Dave on one of his uh, bat research caving expeditions. Um, and uh, we've asked him to talk about a different expedition that he uh, went on independently here today. And he's going to tell us a little bit about it. Dave, what are we you looking at here? Yeah, this location is in uh, the Northwest Territories in Nahani National Park, and uh, we're just coming down a descent now that we've uh, we've hiked to the top of the mountain for about five hours to beat the heat of the day, and then uh, setting up our rappels. Three other members of the team have already gone down, so my role at this stage is going down, re- readjusting all the uh, protection that you're seeing in the black lines on top of the rope. The idea with that is that we don't uh, cut through the rope as we're ascending coming up later and you'll see that in the video but this is a nice little drop down so the uh, the vertical height down to that river is about 480 meters um, and right now we also have a crew that uh, was from Calgary that uh, was happened to be rafting down the river and uh, they're watching us down from below so the the uh, trees and that texture that you can see down by the river that looks just kind of like roughening those are full height spruce and pine trees mostly spruce so it kind of put it in perspective a little bit for height why are you going into this cave so this cave is one that was recorded in the 70s as having the potential for bad activity and we wanted to confirm that there is actually bad activity in that space and uh, set up some roost loggers to monitor acoustic use and uh, we can get a better handle on winter use versus summer use and uh, get a, a good idea what we're actually seeing for bat numbers and species. So where are we now? Are we inside the cave you're descending toward? Uh, this one's actually a different cave down the ridge line, but uh, the same basic features in this uh, entire uh, cave area. That stage we were walking through is just getting into these uh, different locations. So some of the features in here include this uh, skeletonized doll's sheep. That skeletonized doll sheep is one of 109 different individuals that were lost in that cave. When you're in a cave, what, what specifically are you looking for? Depends on our goals, but in this case we're looking primarily for bad activity. So as you can see in the images here, there's a small crevice in there with a little mummified bat. It's desiccated and dried out. So I have an envelope underneath and I'm using a, uh, a wire tweezer system to pull out the remains. The, uh, the remains we'll use for identifying the species. We'll use that for uh, getting a better handle on uh, time of death. We can do carbon dating on uh, different organic pieces in there and it gives us a better handle handle on what's actually in that cave system, what's when, what has been using it over the time. And you use technology quite a bit when you are on these expeditions as well. Can you tell me about what we're looking at? So right now we're looking at a roost logger and I'm actually showing Melissa, she's one of the team members, and uh, uh, Greg and Christian how we set these up, how we use them, how we implement them. They're pre-programmed and these are functionally designed to capture any vocalizations that the bats are making. So we can get species, we can get relative abundance. Uh, right now this is a, a roost logger that was in the cave for two years and you can see that memory card coming out. The memory card will put into a uh, tablet so we can see what kind of data we've actually hit in a very crude way while we're in the field. Then we can do post-analysis after the fact back in the, in the comfort of our office. Mm. These are unique environments. Um, tell me a little bit about why this looks the way it does. So this is a in the same cave, actually, that we were just setting up that roost logger. In here, this is uh, an ice-covered floor and the ceiling and the walls in this case are covered in hoarfrost. That hoarfrost is uh, deposition from the breathing of the cave. So as we get movements of air, uh, warmer, moist air meeting cold temperatures, we get that frost formation. And this is one, one entrance into this system, whereas the other uh, entrances are not like this at all. So it, it's a very dynamic system and it tells us a lot about the caves and the cave environments. Now this cave here is again very different. This is the one we repelled into. As you can see on the floor, as we're going in, we're all wearing dry suits uh, underneath our caving gear because there's about a foot of water that we're walking through right now. That water is lay overlaying ice, so the white crystals you can see in the back there, that, that's ice. It's a very cold, very 
uh, I'd say not not a hospitable environment for a lot of people to enjoy for their uh, summer vacations. Is this dangerous work? Uh, again, I think danger is, is a relative term in a lot of ways. Uh, we're in a very remote location, so we're moving very cautiously, we're moving very carefully. We're very self-sufficient. We carry all our rescue gear on us for personal use. We have uh, satellites, communication, we have an in-reach as well. So that's a, a GPS link texting option that we can send information back for if we did need more serious assistance. So we're, we're very well trained, but we're also very cautious. What are we uh, photographing? So in here I found a bat again in another crevice, and this is in a, a different cave on, uh, on the ridge line. That bat was just waking up, which was interesting, and about five or ten minutes later he came out and covered in condensation, hanging by one foot, just letting all that condensation come off, and then he was uh, heading out to go hunt for the evening because there's so many insects up there to feed on. Now this space is a, an example of... Uh, there was a, a very sketchy... Uh, long and somewhat dangerous climb to go up and over this space. Uh, we decided, uh, as I was kind of looking around at the floor a little bit more, that if I moved a few rocks out of the way, I might be able to bypass that. So after about 45 seconds or so of moving, we were able to bypass that dangerous climb, dangerous descent, and uh, go right into a new uh, passageway. And a uh, little bit of a squeeze, and maybe not as comfortable for some as others, but uh, in, in caving, as you experienced, it's uh, there's some small spaces and some big spaces that you have to kind of work through. So this is on the other side of the uh, that small little bypass that we put together. I'm finding all kinds of bones in here. There's a vertebra that we're seeing, the atlas and the axis on the vertebra. There's a lot of guano, there's a lot of pack rat pellets, uh, fe fecal deposition or excrement. Uh, you can see that entire pile is uh, completely covering the floor and it almost echoes when you stand on it. And in here between all the boulders we're looking at, uh, again, bat skulls, finger bones, wing bones, uh, all of these things are pointing as signs to occupation uh, on this cave or in this cave. In the bottom here as we're digging around, we're pulling up droppings and we're also pulling up uh, in here you can see that larger piece in the background is uh, a skull from a bat. So it gives you kind of a perspective of size. Now again, if we didn't have live bats in here, that would have been an amazing find to actually say, hey, there, there's carcasses and remains of these bats that are on site. So this is the uh, exit out of uh, one of the caves that we uh, had repelled into and uh, did a fair amount of work inside. But we've come out now and uh, we take off all our, our dry gear, our dry suits, or uh, our cave suits, because it's so hot uh, as we're coming up and moving around that we'd, we'd have heat exhaustion going up this uh, ascent. Uh, so we're, we're using ascenders, climbing up. I'm again the last person out. It's uh, definitely strenuous work because you, you may not get that feeling from the the video it's it's vertical so as you look down now if, if uh, you can see some of the gear in the bags and you can see that the river again in the bottom the uh, the fall line is is where gravity is so that, that's you don't get any steeper than where we are this work clearly isn't for the faint of heart or for everybody um what is it you enjoy about it you seem to enjoy it uh, I, th I think the work itself, it's amazing to be able to help out and uh, work with a species or multiple species to make sure that they're propagated and moving forward. Because ultimately bats as a group are so important agriculturally and biologically to our, our standing on the planet. Uh, they're helping out with pollination from some of the southern bats. They do insect and forest uh, pest management in more of our northern species because we're mostly insectivorous bats. Uh, the passion, I guess, comes from a lot of the camaraderie with the team. Like the, the group we had on this trip in the Hani was an amazing group. Everybody was keen, everybody was engaged, and they're, they're all passionate about not just the caving and new experiences, but about the bats. And it's amazing to be able to go out with people and all of us bring different pieces to the table that we can help train each other and improve our knowledge and abilities in different ways. Now this is coming up right at the top of our, our pitch, so right above the cave, and you can see the ledges that we're walking on. So as you turn around, you can see the river and that fall line. It looks quite flat in the video, but that that's, uh, that's straight down, uh, quite a distance to the bottom, and I'm just cleaning up a little bit of gear so I don't get hung up on the uh, rope as I turn around. And we'll just walk back, get geared up, and then uh, we'll hike back to camp and get ready to do this again the, the next day. You make it sound so easy. 
well, I, I wouldn't say easy, but uh, it, it's definitely enjoyable. And it, one of the beautiful things that we found out that night is that the same group that we saw or that was looking at us from the bottom, the, the uh, canoers and the rafters that were down there, we got back and they'd uh, left us supper, which was amazing. It was a uh, fresh homemade lasagna and uh, they had some dessert. I can't remember if it was... It was brownies or squares, but uh, either way, it was delicious after a long, long day of travel. Dave, thanks for joining me today. Anytime, Scott, and uh, looking forward to the next time you come out and join us on an adventure.